Hi, and welcome back. Let's just have a little chat about channel strip plugins to start with, because generally speaking, I don't think these tend to be well thought through. First of all, let's have a think about the channel strip on a real analog console. One of the main limiting factors is available space. Imagine a console which provided fully parametric four band EQ, plus full featured dynamics on every channel, as well as the usual dozen or so aux sends and routing switches. You would need arms like Mr. Tickle to operate it. In case you don't get that reference, I just mean you'd need really long arms. Of course, you could make each channel twice as wide, but then you'd only get half the channel count, or else you'd double the console's footprint. So decisions like limiting compressor controls to fast, slow switches, rather than attack and release knobs, stem mostly from that basic limitation. You might be of the opinion that the reduced control set is inherently beneficial and helps you to work quicker. And I can't argue with you if so. But that wasn't the reason for these control decisions. Console designers would undoubtedly have provided attack and release controls for the compressors and cue for the EQ bands had they had the space available. And it's notable that every hardware digital console I've ever used has indeed provided all those controls. Designers of digital consoles don't appear to regard these limitations as desirable. So let's have a think about plug-in channel strips. Basically, I think these fit into two different categories. But the developers of these plugins don't all appear to have realized that. And consequently, many of the channel strip plugins I've tried seem to sit awkwardly between the two, having apparently not quite decided which category they want to fit into. Let's start with the first category, which is covered quite nicely by the Waves channel strips shown here. The feature set is limited to what you'd get on the hardware console. Clearly the intention is to provide the color of that specific console, rather than to be your primary mixing tool. I therefore think of this type of strip as a tracking console channel strip. If you're using an instance on every channel, chances are you're applying some preliminary EQ, maybe a bit of preamp saturation, then largely leaving those settings alone while you finish the mix using other tools. If you use a Neve flavored channel strip at the start of every plugin chain, you can pretend you're mixing a project that was tracked through a Neve console. But with the added bonus that you can reach back to the tracking stage and dial something back if you overdid it. In this case, the most important factor is how well the plugin emulates that console's behavior. Or perhaps just how good does it sound? And if the plugin preserves all the same limitations as that console, that's arguably a good thing. For it to sound the same as the real console, it needs to guide you towards the same kinds of decisions as the real console. If those limitations mean it can't get you all the way to a finished mix, that's okay. The tracking console isn't supposed to produce the final mix. That's the job of the mixing console. And that brings me to the other type of plug-in channel strip, ones that aim to be a mixing tool. Obviously, these still need to sound good. The processing on offer needs to be comparable to other rival plugins, and preferably better than the stock DAW options. But in this case, the main reason to use a channel strip rather than individual separate plugins is workflow. Having the majority of your mixing tools in a single plugin saves you time loading individual plugins and subsequently having to open multiple different interfaces. I have a lot of sympathy with this philosophy. Mixing is an iterative process and nothing is final until you actually hit render. It's therefore quite normal and unremarkable to have to revisit the settings for a specific channel multiple times during the course of a mix. And only having one interface to pull up to do so can save a significant amount of time. For a channel strip to succeed by this criteria, it needs two possibly contradictory qualities. It needs to be quick and fast to operate, so the ergonomics need to be well thought out. And indeed, this is much more important than it looking like a real console, in my opinion. And it also needs to be flexible and powerful enough to get you at least most of the way to a finished mix. Because as soon as you run into a limitation that means you have to load another plugin instead, the strip has failed in a key criteria. Slate's Virtual Mix Rack plugin definitely fits into my mixing channel strip category, in my opinion. The goal here is quite clearly to provide every possible flavor of processing within the channel strip. So as far as possible, each DAW channel will only need a single VMR and no other plugins. Of course, it achieves that by essentially providing plugins within a plugin, which you could argue is just moving the problem somewhere else. 
But once you've picked your chain or loaded a preset, you have everything within a single interface with all parameters available at once. Well, at least until you've loaded too many modules and you have to start scrolling them. But Slate made the canny decision to emulate 500 series modules and limit the width of each module accordingly. This means there's limited space for controls on each module, and they therefore tend to stick to the core essential functions. But there is still enough space to include all those essential controls, like attack and release for a compressor, or an EQ with fully parametric mid-bands. You could argue that limiting the control set to these essential parameters is a good thing, and I would have a lot of sympathy with your argument. Bear with me while I veer off on a tangent to a tangent, but more controls does not equal more control. Let me illustrate that with a reverb plugin. Behind the scenes, this effect is in actual fact hundreds of individual delay taps with individual feedback and diffusion and level and panning. Can you imagine what the interface would look like if we had individual controls for each of those behind the scenes parameters? In that case, we would have more controls, but way less control. We'd have the freedom to create an infinite number of probably really bad sounding settings and infinite, insignificantly different variations of every setting. But useful settings and meaningful tweaks would become way harder to find. In fact, one of the most important aspects of reverb design is the way those thousands of internal parameters are mapped to just a small handful of controls. The most successful designs will maximize the good sounding settings combinations available and minimize the bad sounding ones and make it as easy as possible to steer towards your goal. In that respect, I think Virtual Mix Rack strikes a pretty good balance. There's enough control to cover most situations, but still most of the time you'll be able to see all the settings for a channel at once. So that brings me to the Harrison 32C channel strip plugin. I've been seeing lots of adverts for this recently, so I thought I'd grab the demo and try it out. The first thing you might notice is that this is still the demo version, so I'm going to have to keep clicking the nag screen away. It means that, I'm afraid, I've not been convinced to click the buy button, even with the introductory discount. I'll explain why in a moment. But if the nag screen irritates you as a viewer, my apologies. But this is actually my favorite feature of the plugin so far. It's vastly preferable to an audible hiss or periodic muting of the signal. And it means I can actually use it in real projects and evaluate the sound properly. So first question, which category of channel strip should I put this into? Is it a tracking strip that I'll just use to apply some initial color before finishing the mix as normal? Or is it intended as your main mixing toolkit? I'm not sure, to be honest, and I'm not sure the developers are either. On the one hand, the EQ and filters are apparently modeled on the original analog Harrison 32C console. According to the marketing, the 32C channel plugin provides a complex emulation of the original Harrison 32C EQ. Every resistor, capacitor, and transistor is included in the model. This strongly suggests there's some special color in the EQ that might make you want to use it as a tracking channel strip to emulate the sound you get from tracking through an original 32C console. However, there's no saturation at all anywhere. The EQ is clean as a whistle, just like Pro-Q3 or your stock EQ probably. There's no preamp emulation, no harmonics added anywhere, except presumably the usual ones you get from dynamics processing. This is an interesting choice. Now, I made the mistake of stumbling into a thread on the subject on gear sluts. Sorry, gear snobs. I mean gear space. This was mostly just multiple car pileup, really, but there were some interesting responses from a Harrison representative. That's true, we don't add any distortion or noise in our channel EQs. In case you doubted me on that point, as I'm aware I haven't provided any evidence for it yet. UAD makes a great oversampled emulation of the console EQ, which adds some color if that's what you're after. As the original developer of the console, we aren't that focused on the artifacts of an old console, which largely weren't there when the consoles were new, but rather the painstaking work that went into voicing the EQ itself. So this strongly suggests that the plugin isn't intended as a coloring box. Indeed, do I even detect a hint of disdain that the suggestion a brand new Harrison analog console would be any less clean and pristine sounding than a DAW. 
I don't have one of those in my studio, you won't be surprised to learn. So I'll have to take their word for it that, under normal operation, a new Harrison board can be considered totally clean. But of course, there's no analogue console anywhere with infinite headroom. If you keep cranking the game, sooner or later you'll get distortion and extra harmonics. Whether that's good or bad, it's an option you'd have with the analogue hardware that you don't get in the plug-in. So considered as a colouring, tracking channel strip, the only possible source of any magic source can be either the particular behaviour of the compressor section or the special sexy curves on offer from the EQ. So let's try the EQ first. After all, every resistor, capacitor and transistor is included in the model, so this should be pretty special, right? Here's a low shelving boost. I'll give it a realistic plus 6 dB at 150 Hz. It sounds much as I would expect a low shelf boost to sound, to be honest. It sounds good, but I'm not sure I'm hearing any special magic yet. So we need a reference, I guess. Let's pull up my stock EQ, which as I'm a Reaper guy means re-EQ, and try a similar boost. Matching the frequency and gain is easy, I can just type them in but I'll have to use my judgement when setting the bandwidth in re-EQ, as there's no equivalent parameter in the 32C plugin. What do you think? Do they sound the same? Well, I personally don't think they do. It seems to me like the 32C plug-in sounds a little warmer, richer, fuller bodied. The kick sounds a bit deeper with the channel strip plug-in, to my ears. It's quite subtle, but I'm confident I can hear it. Or am I? Am I just imagining it? Let's try a null test. And no, we're nowhere near a null, regardless of my bandwidth setting. But this is a surprisingly big difference, and I'm not inclined to leave it there, as it doesn't quite smell right. There shouldn't be this much difference between two EQs that are working correctly, in my opinion. So I loaded them up in Plugin Doctor, and sure enough there are more differences beyond just the bandwidth setting. I had to set a different frequency in re-EQ to match the curve from 32C. Fair enough, you could say. We're arguably picking an arbitrary point on the shelf slope to define as the turnover frequency, so it's understandable that two different EQs choose to define this differently. At least it's nothing like the crazy discrepancies I found in the Amec console EQ when the glow and sheen options were enabled. However, I also needed to increase the gain in re-EQ. This one isn't really open to debate, the 32C shelf is applying more than the 12 dB of boost I've dialed in. That's just a fact. Armed with this information, let's go back to the null test. And it's now not too difficult to find a perfect null, which drops right off the bottom of my analyzer. Which is interesting. What happened to all those resistors, capacitors and transistors? Let's try a mid-bell at 1K. And I'm going to check this in the doctor first. The gain is off again, though not by very much this time. But the frequency is also wrong, and unlike a shelf, you can say definitively where the centre of a bell is, especially if you switch to show phase shift. That zero phase crossing indicates the centre of the bell when it's not at one kilohertz. OK, so perfect null again. Let's try a 10 kilohertz bell. Same drill. Perfect null. And a 10k shelf 
perfect null. If the developers really did model every resistor, capacitor and transistor in the original EQ, they could have saved themselves some time by just grabbing the Robert Bristow Johnson algorithms that I used to use when building in Reactor, which also null perfectly with re-EQ. And as a bonus, they'd be showing the correct frequency and gain settings too. There's a cynical part of me that wonders if the incorrect frequency and gain settings is actually just an attempt to foil a superficial null test. They don't want to make it too easy to prove that this is just a standard digital EQ. Then there's a much less cynical part of me that thinks this is probably a genuine attempt to match the original analogue console EQ, and that it's motivated by a genuine belief that there's something special about this behaviour. Maybe limiting your EQ options to four bands with only these curves available will actually improve your mixes? But I confess I'm not convinced. Re-EQ can recreate any of those curves perfectly, but can also do very different shapes when needed, and provides as many bands as you want. You're going to struggle to convince me that's not better. And yes, by the way, that means this EQ cramps near Nyquist. I've made a video explaining what that means, so I won't repeat myself here. Hopefully you're seeing a card for that one now. I've also made a video that compares re-EQ with Pro-Q3 and attempts to assess how much of a problem the cramping really is in practice. Again, card, hopefully. But in case you don't want to sit through that, the short version is that, assuming you adjust the bandwidth to compensate for the cramping, the differences are actually pretty subtle. But of course, you can't adjust the bandwidth in 32C, because reasons. I'm going to come back to that. But it means that the high bell gets narrower as you approach the upper limits, and there's nothing you can do about it. Now, if there was some colourful saturation on offer from the EQ, or a preamp section that could be used to add harmonics, I would regard this as disappointing and surprising, but not a deal breaker in itself, because a cramping EQ is still fine for 90% or more of your EQ duties. But when the EQ is the main colour on offer, supposedly at least, this is kind of a problem particularly if recreating the behaviour of the original board was a priority. I guarantee the analogue 32C EQs don't cramp near Nyquist. Shall we try the high and low pass filters? I'm struggling to get excited about them, to be honest, knowing them to be clean and free of any potentially interesting non-linearities. But let's try nulling them against re-EQ's filters. I have to do both at once. And sure enough, there's a perfect null again. It also bothers me slightly that I can't have a high-pass filter without also enabling the cramping resonance of the low-pass filter. I don't really understand why these aren't separately switchable. So, as far as colour is concerned, so far we have no more than is provided by Reaper's stock EQ plugin. But perhaps there's something special about those particular resonance settings they've chosen. I'll give the filters a fair chance, and try a trick I often like to use with colourful filters. I'll high-pass filter the low end of the drum bus, with just a touch of a resonant bump. The normal bump is enough, I don't think I want the extra, in this case it's too much. And I'll also bracket the high end with the low-pass filter. Around 10k usually does the trick. But that's sounding a little dull, so I'll try a touch higher. Unfortunately, I don't have the option to increase the resonance for this one. And let's toggle bypass. I'm not convinced, to be honest. I think I prefer it without. For reference, here are some genuinely colourful non-linear filters doing the same kind of thing, but with the gain carefully tuned so they're saturating nicely. The compressor section is going to have to be good to save this one. Let's give it a spin. There are three different modes on offer here, which are apparently derived from the most commonly used settings in Harrison's hardware consoles. And that's quite an interesting idea. <laughs> 
The first setting is described in the blurb as a compressor mode with an adjustable ratio, moderate attack and program dependent auto release. For general purpose, guitar, keyboard, and overall mix compression. They say adjustable ratio as if that's some kind of unique selling point for a compressor. But in fact, it's just code for there are no attack or release controls. And I mean none, not even a measly fast or slow switch. Next up, the leveler mode with an adjustable attack, a fast release, and a very gentle ratio for always on vocal compression. And this really does have a very gentle ratio, which is interesting. Or there's a limiter with adjustable release timing, instant attack, aggressive ratio, and a multi-stage hold plus release envelope for drums and other percussive sources. And yes, this is definitely a limiter. So okay, for a limiter, I guess I'm okay with only having control over release time. The slowest release time on offer isn't particularly slow. But the fastest promises to be really fast. One millisecond suggests to me that we'll be exploring the grey area between limiting and distortion, meant adding growl or crunchiness to the sound. But unfortunately, it just sounds bad. I can hear the program dependency struggling to prevent any distortion, when there's nothing about that sound I like. Honestly, I'd rather just have the distortion. In a mixing context, a crunchy limiter with character would be much more useful than a mediocre mastering style limiter that attempts to do brick wall limiting without the benefits of look ahead, in my opinion. For reference, here's a good character limiter doing a similar amount of squash. Let's talk about the leveler mode. And goodness me, it's gentle. This is suggested as a vocal setting. And sure enough, this type of setting can be useful on vocals. But it's unlikely to be the only compressor you need on a vocal, unless it was tracked through compressors that were spanking it hard on the way in. There are two possible ways I could imagine the leveler mode becoming way more useful. First of all, it could have a very gentle knee so that you get into higher ratios if you really push it hard. This would make it much more useful and versatile, in my opinion, while still allowing it to perform its intended function. But second, and more importantly, why is this choice forced upon me? This isn't hardware. There are no physical limitations. Why can't I run the compressor and the leveler at the same time, with the limiter also active at the end of the chain to catch rogue peaks? These great big buttons here could be used to just switch which controls were visible, right? There's no reason all three Dynamics models couldn't be active simultaneously. So let's have a listen to the first compressor mode. And actually, this sounds good. Really good, in fact. For the first time, I'm hearing some proper character from this plugin, and I really like it. <laughs> 
There's a nicely aggressive snap added to transients. And the auto release has reacted in useful and interesting ways to everything I've thrown at it so far. I was hoping I'd be able to find a redeeming feature in this plugin because I don't like being too negative. And this seems to be it. Almost. Because actually, I'm finding this quite deeply frustrating. My natural reaction to hearing delicious compression like this is to grab the attack knob and listen to how it responds when I go really fast and smash off the transients completely. Or when I slow down the attack, what kind of punchy, thumpy characteristics emerge? Can I adjust the release to make it pump and breathe in interesting ways? Or groove better with the song? I'm dying to explore this compressor further and find out all that it's capable of, but I can't because all I've got is a ratio control. So if we're judging this channel strip by how close it can get me to a final mix before I have to load something else, well I don't think I'm going to get very far before I want to control attack or release times and need to load a different compressor. And I have to ask, why aren't there attack and release controls? It's not a hardware channel strip with physical space limitations. You can just make the interface bigger if you run out of space. But in this case, that wouldn't even be necessary. I mean, do these buttons really need to be that large? All three could easily fit in the space that one currently occupies, leaving plenty of room for two more knobs. Failing that, I would quite happily swap the leveler and limiter modes for proper control over one really good compressor. Attack and release controls are not superfluous extra features that just get in the way. They're crucial to getting a mix just right. Removing these options isn't the same as stripping things down to the core essential controls, as Slate manages quite successfully with the virtual mix rack. It goes a step too far, in my opinion, when constitutes dumbing down. While we're on the subject, why don't we have Q controls for the EQ bands? It's not like there isn't room. There's plenty. When if there wasn't, you could make room. Now I know, the magic of the Harrison EQ is all in the gain Q interaction. It must be all there, because I can't find any anywhere else. But a couple of points. Having a Q control doesn't preclude also having gain Q interaction. You can keep it just as it is, but still allow us to make the bell wider or narrower as needed. But also, having a Q control makes the gain Q interaction rather less important. And I would go further and say, having a Q control that you can adjust with the mouse wheel, while simultaneously setting the frequency and gain, as I routinely do in Pro-Q3, makes gain Q interaction totally irrelevant. The FabFilter EQ does have an option to link gain in Q, by the way, but I never use it. Not because I think it's bad. I genuinely have no opinion, because I just have no use for it. With Pro Q3, the Q is where I want it, with just a quick flick of the wheel, and that's all that matters. So again, the lack of Q controls in the EQ just makes it that much more likely that I'll need to load a different EQ plugin. That's without even mentioning the likelihood of running out of bands, with only four available. Yes, I know, analog consoles have four band EQs, and when I mixed on them, I regularly ran out of bands. And while I'm at it, why won't it let me adjust the low mid-band lower than 180 hertz, or the high mid-band higher than 8 kilohertz? These are totally arbitrary limits. I don't care if the original Harrison EQ also had those parameter ranges, it would annoy me on the real console too. But it's even more frustrating when I know for a fact there's no good reason for it. And again, it increases the likelihood that the 32C EQ won't cut the mustard for some sources, and I'll be forced to load another EQ. Now, with all these compromises in mind, consider the fact that they nevertheless gave us both input and output gain controls for a totally linear plugin with no saturation. This annoys me more than it probably should. But it seems to me they're included just because that's what a channel strip is supposed to have, rather than with any thought as to how they would be used. Of course, you only need one gain control for a saturation-free channel strip. But anyway, in my opinion, a much more useful implementation would be to just provide the EQ section with its own gain control, which would be bypassed along with the EQ when you bypass that. As the dynamics section already has a gain compensation knob, the EQ is the only other reason you'll need to make a gain correction. If that gain control was grouped with the EQ, it would make it easier to assess the settings when bypassing just the EQ section and it would also make it faster and easier to explore the routing options at the bottom. If the EQ had gain compensation that moved with it, you'd be less likely to have to adjust the threshold when changing the order of the compressor and EQ sections. 
So here's my summary. If I'm to consider this as a tracking console strip, intended to colour all my channels with some Harrison flavour before I go on to mix them as normal, then I consider the lack of saturation a major flaw. That's what colour mostly is, after all, right? And while Ben from Harrison can claim that actually a real Harrison console is totally clean as well, he's also happy to endorse the UAD version, which apparently does have saturation goodness included. So there is indeed a flavour of console saturation that Harrison are prepared to put their name to, and I feel like we should have some of that goodness in this channel strip before I'll consider using it as a Harrison flavoured tracking console. On the other hand, if I'm to consider this as a mixing channel strip, it falls short in a variety of ways. I'm going to continually run out of EQ bands. I'm going to need a different EQ for my airy high frequency boosts. I'm going to need a different compressor every time I want control over attack or release times. And don't even think about anything more complex like DSing. There's no sidechain filtering for the compressor, so it's not going to happen. For a mixing channel strip to be successful, it needs to be as powerful and flexible as possible, while still being intuitive and easy to use, with everything on display simultaneously in a single interface. That's not an easy brief, as those demands pull against one another. But nevertheless, that's the challenge. And I feel like many developers of channel strips haven't really thought through what they're trying to achieve with their plugins. Is it the character of the console, warts and all, including all its limitations? Or is it a new and better way to mix in a DAW? Pick one, because you can't do both. So that's why I'm going to pass on this one, I'm afraid. But I'll finish off with some totally unsolicited advice for Harrison. If you build a plugin around this compressor, but with full control over attack and release, and maybe also other stuff like program dependency, squash these EQ and filter knobs closer together and patch them to the compressor side chain instead of putting them in the main signal path and sell it as a cool-sounding, full-featured compressor. I'd probably buy that. That's all. Thanks for watching.